Welcome to Stereo 3D Productions and this review video of the Valve Index. Yeah, you heard that right. At this point, with the amount of time I've used the headset for and the variety of things I've tried with it, this is going to venture well beyond first impressions as I've now gotten my fair share of experience with the kit. We're going from first impressions to straight up review. We're going to do the usual drill I go through when reviewing a new kit. First, we're going to take a look at the hardware, then we're going to set it all up and take a look at the software, and finally, we'll get into a broad spectrum of gameplay and experiences, each with the specific purpose of evaluating different aspects of the Valve Index. Before I get started, I must admit that this kit took me by surprise. Yes, even with the kind of expectation I had for it, I also had serious doubts. Using an updated lighthouse system, would Valve have managed to improve over the original Vive's lackluster tracking? Would Valve be able to raise the bar on VR standards with their headset, its resolution, its lenses, and its overall design? Would the index controllers prove to be a big game changer or a gimmicky nuisance? Well, it turns out that a lot of these questions were answered along with the making of this review, and they were answered in so many very positive ways. The first thing we have to look at here is the hardware we get in the box. The full Valve Index kit comes with a headset, a pair of next generation SteamVR lighthouses, a pair of Index or Knuckles controllers, all the plugs and connection accessories along with a special pad for fitting the headset on someone with a small head. I have to give it to Valve. I'm not much for excessive packaging and I don't particularly care for overzealous presentation but I can't deny, I kind of appreciated how this kit was presented in its box. While it looks pretty good, most of the packaging is designed with function in mind, protecting all the components, including the likely fragile lighthouses and controllers, all while maintaining a very sleek appearance. I'm actually going to hold on to this box in case I ever need to carry the kit anywhere. We're going to cover the lighthouses more in the setup section of this video, so let's just skip right ahead to the other components that matter. Let's begin with the controllers. It's easy to notice that these are very different. They're definitely no Vive wands, nor are they Oculus Touch and or Vive Cosmos. They're in the world of their own. Each side features a system power button, two actions button, A and B, a trackpad, a thumbstick you can press down, a trigger, and finally a grip sensor. Th that's right, not a grip button, but a grip sensor. These units are lightweight, and the way you fit them on your hands is quite different. They tightly but comfortably strap onto the palm of your hand, allowing the player to freely open and close their hands without dropping the controllers. The trigger, grip sensor, and trackpad come together as finger sensors, allowing each of the player's finger positions to be individually tracked. There's just one worry I have with these. They don't just look fragile, it's obvious that they are fragile. And a replacement is not cheap at over $200 a pair. It will be important for anyone who owns these to be very careful, especially when engaging in high action activities, as it seems as little as a bump at the wrong angle could spell the end for one of these controllers. The weak point appears to be the tracking bracket, an essential component which consists of a hoop on the outside of each controller held by two relatively thin plastic struts. It's going to be very important to plan long room scale sessions and make sure there's nothing in the way I could accidentally punch. These controllers may be extremely capable, but they are evidently not as robust as Oculus Touch. Next component we're going to take a look at is the headset itself. Now, if you look on paper, you'd think Valve is nuts. This little machine weighs in at an all time high, 810 grams. Sure, that actually sounds like you have to tie a brick to your face, but rest assured, I'll say it right away, this has to be the most comfortable headset I have worn to date, and I've worn my share of headsets. Don't be put off by the weight, for me it hasn't really been an issue since the whole thing actually feels properly balanced once it's on your head. Finding your comfort zone is super easy. Loosen the back strap by turning the dial, put the headset on your head, Tighten the back strap with the dial, pivot the display until it's in line with your eyes and giving a clear image, 
Adjust the top head strap and finally tweak your IPD, adjusting the button slider on the bottom of the headset, a slider that's very similar to the one on the original Oculus Rift. Last but not least, in terms of adjustment, you have an eye relief adjustment knob on the right front of the headset. It's similar to the HTC Vive's eye relief and I feel like it's done better on the index. You can find that perfect balance between field of view and comfort, and it's probably very useful to those who wear glasses. I've tried most of the second generation headsets, and I've got to give it to the Index, it's the one I've found the most comfortable by far. I've worn the thing for upwards of 8 hours in a row, playing Elite Dangerous, and the whole entire time it was easy to forget I was even wearing it. One of the things that contributes greatly to the comfort level of this headset are these open headphones. Not only do these produce surprisingly good audio, I was a skeptic until I first tried them, but the fact that they're not making contact with your head goes an extremely long way into forgetting that you're even wearing a VR headset to begin with. Add to this the fact that the sound quality easily beats the Vive Cosmos, the Oculus Rift S and the Oculus Quest, it's quite impressive to finally get a kit that comes with an audio system that's not half-hearted. I do however have a complaint here. Much like most of the headsets in second generation VR, the face foam isn't velcro detachable. Rather they went with a face gasket assembly. I really find that disappointing as it's a blemish on an otherwise near perfect design. Velcro detachable face foams make hygiene much easier. With the Vive for example, all you had to do is pull off the face foam, wash it, and if you had a spare on hand, you could switch to a dry one right away. In this case, you have to remove the entire plastic assembly and wash the face foam while it's still attached to it. To make matters even less optimal, they don't include a spare, which could have gone a long way into making the kit more convenient. Fortunately, Valve do sell extra phase gaskets by the pair. I myself bought two extra phase gaskets, so now, when I've got to wash one, I have another dry, clean face foam available. Some may wonder why I didn't get the VR cover kit for the Index. See, while the VR cover kit adds the ability to detach face foams with Velcro, the solution is actually more expensive than ordering the pair of extra stock face gaskets, and since I find the stock face foam to be incredibly comfortable, I decided to avoid the gamble on the more costly VR cover solution. Last but not least here, and this is probably the bigger problem with the lack of Velcro foams, the rear padding is not Velcro detachable either, and cleaning that foam is going to be a little more complicated than the one on the face gaskets. Some people have suggested using the large back padding that comes with the headset, but I haven't found it to be as comfortable to wear with that thing on. The only good thing here is cleaning the back foam won't have to be done quite as frequently as the face foams. I'll let you take a brief look at the cleaning process I've put in place for my index. It's nothing too complicated and for now it looks like it should keep my headset tidy on the long term. First, cleaning the face foams is the easiest part. I just go ahead and fill the sink with warm water, dump in a bit of laundry detergent, and dump my three gaskets right in there. I soak the entire face foam, squeeze them a little, and then I drain the sink, wring the foams, and proceed to rinsing. All I do at this point is soak each foam directly in the water stream, wring it, repeat one more time, and it's good to go. Finally, I squeeze the face foams in a dry towel to remove the bulk of the water and leave the gaskets out to fully dry over a few hours. For the headset itself, I simply repeat the same process, fill up the sink and... Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> just kidding. I put the headset in the dishwasher. Uh, I mean, the laundry machine. No, no, okay, seriously, don't do that shit. In my case, all I do is perform a sort of dry clean using friction alcohol. I rub down all the plastic surfaces, the rubber gasket around the lenses, the lenses themselves, and finally, I give the back foam two or three passes rubbing it gently with a friction alcohol soaked cloth. There's a lot of people who would express concern over using friction alcohol, but after using this to clean headsets for four generations of technology since 2013, I can assure you it has no negative effect on the unit other than getting you that clean, fresh feel for hundreds and hundreds of hours of use. There's another aspect that warrants a little bit of complaining, yet a lot of praise as well. 
the lenses. Again, here we're looking at Fresnel lenses designed to give a spherical projection, allowing you to move your eyes when you look around without having the impression of looking at a pair of flat screens. See, in this case, I'm mostly impressed, but I cannot ignore the fact that there is a good deal of light scatter in these. It's not quite the same effect as you'd see in the original Oculus Rift. There aren't quite any god rays in these lenses, but you can get a sort of glow around the edges of the lenses in high contrast situations, and if you're dealing with a scene that's almost entirely dark with a bright point of light in the center, the glow resulting from light scatter in the lenses can become distracting. The good thing is while the glow can happen, it takes extreme contrast for it to become a problem. And for the most part, even games that are mostly dark, like Alien Isolation or Half-Life Alex, did not give me enough of these light artifacts to become an actual problem. It's not a prominent issue, but it's just something I felt I needed to point out. Despite the scatter issue, I did say that these lenses deserve their share of praise. Let it be known, I do think these are the best Fresnel lenses on the VR market at the moment. They have a fairly large sweet spot, but more importantly, the spherical projection is nearly perfect. If you've watched my Pimax 8K video, you'll remember I was highly critical of that kit's lenses, complaining on how a lot of the outside field of view was being unwarped wrong, featured chromatic aberration, and even a distorted image. While on paper, the index doesn't have nearly as much field of view as the Pimax, the fact that these lenses project the image so well makes 100% of the visible field of view useful to your eye. The very edges of the image aren't perfect, but this is still the most even projection I've ever seen with this large of a field of view. By now, I've already done over 20 hours of racing simulation with the Index, and it was impressive how natural the image felt the whole time, being able to turn my eyes almost into the car's blind spot without moving my head. For the lenses, they may not be perfect, but their positive aspects greatly outweigh the negatives. Last but not least, while the Index doesn't feature quite the highest resolution on the market, only 2880 by 1600 or 1440 by 1600 per eye, the fact that it uses LCD RGB displays over the previous generation's OLED displays greatly reduces screen door effect despite the only slight increase in total pixels. I find the Vive Cosmos had a greater perceivable pixel density than the Index, albeit with a much lower field of view, but I do find the Index wins over the Oculus Quest in terms of improvements over the first generation. This is a very solid second generation pixel density, and given it's got a greater field of view than most its competitors, when it comes to resolution and field of view balance, the Index demonstrates great fidelity. Now, it's time to take a look at how we put everything together before we can get started doing some VR. All right, it's time to set up our Valve Index for the first time. Now, if I compare this to, say, the setup of PlayStation VR, this is quite a simpler process because PlayStation VR had quite a few hookups to make. Uh, but if I compare this to second generation Oculus kits, this is a little bit more complicated. It looks like Oculus have drilled it down to the point where I would not even need to make a setup section to a review video of their headsets. But here we go. It's actually quite simple. The first thing is the power adapters that come in the box. There are three power adapters. Each component in the setup does require power. Each lighthouse and the headset. Now here's something that Valve did that's kind of cool, probably makes manufacturing simpler for them, but the power dongles don't have a plug on them. You actually have to attach the plug separately. So I'm gonna attach the North American plug to this. And there we go. All three power adapters work like this. Now this is one of the power adapters for the lighthouses and something I really like, and this dates from the Vive days with the first base station, but this wire is really long. It gives you freedom to place your base stations exactly where you want them. Now, about the base station, well, the 2.0 base stations are quite different from the first edition. Uh, they have a rounded front, and I am really happy to announce that they have one less connection in the back. 
That's right, these base stations synchronize wirelessly. You no longer have to have them seeing each other from across the room like the 1.0 base stations. And with the 1.0 base stations, if you couldn't set them up while they could see each other from across the room, you would have to use the extremely long sync cable. So this is a cable that you would tie between the two stations. There's a 50 foot long cable, and I am really happy not to have to include that in my setup because it was quite cumbersome. So we've gone a long way. Now to mount these, there is a quarter inch socket in the back. There is a quarter inch socket underneath, so you can actually use a standard camera tripod. There is a rubber bottom, so you can actually just place this on any high surface, or you can use the mounting hardware that's included with the valve index. The next step, once you set up both your lighthouses, is the headset, and this is actually relatively simple. So we're going back to the modular here, where the end of the valve index headset cable has this sort of universal adapter here. And I have the standard dongle, which you go ahead and hook up to the end of the headset cable. And this harness that I have here includes DisplayPort, USB, and the power input. So once you're ready to hook up your headset to the computer, then you have your power adapter for the headset. The only difference here is that the connector is smaller, so it makes it very obvious. And of course, the connector here, you can actually detach just like the two others for the lighthouses. So you go ahead and plug this into the wall, Plug this into the headset's harness, hook up your headset over um, DisplayPort and USB 3, and you are set to go. It's really not that complicated. At that point, it really becomes about placing the lighthouses in the best location possible. So let's go take a look at that. It's obvious with a Valve headset that our primary runtimes will be Steam VR. Yes, good old Steam VR. I have to hand it to Valve, the runtimes and software have come quite a long way since the days of constant issues such as tracking losses, the IPD adjustment overlay randomly coming up, and even more infuriating, the numerous issues with the runtimes breaking after an update. I think the worst point for SteamVR came around 2018 where I'm pretty sure every single freshly installed Windows system I tried to install it on refused to detect the headset properly and launch it. In early 2019, I recall often seeing SteamVR insisting on running in safe mode. It seemed impossible to use the runtimes without at least getting one major functionality issue. However, by late 2019, it seems that Valve got their act together. Likely in an effort to provide the best possible experience for Valve Index owners, and issues have progressively begun to fade away since. The last four or five times I've had to do a fresh install of SteamVR, I didn't notice a single issue that stopped me from getting going in a matter of minutes. I have seen a few intermittent random issues, like the runtimes crashing shortly after starting them, but it's a strange bug that happens so rarely, it's never actually affected my gameplay. The tracking losses, represented by the entire screen fading to solid gray for a brief moment, which SteamVR has been notorious for, are much fewer and further apart than even just three months ago. I believe I've recently seen this anomaly happen about twice in over 20 hours of gameplay in the last few weeks, which goes to show how very rare it's become when once upon a time this issue was as regular as clockwork. Okay, let's get SteamVR set up here because there is one fairly large issue left that I really wish they would take care of at Valve. So once you've got your index equipment ready to go, you just have to install SteamVR and the app should first offer you to do a room setup. First, we're going to try doing a real room scale setup. SteamVR will first make you confirm your tracking, then set your center position using one of the controllers, then have you detect your ground level by simply placing the controllers on the floor, and finally, you'll get to trace your play area by moving around with one of the controllers with the trigger pressed down. And this is actually where I've constantly had a problem. See, if you don't have an area the size of a freaking empty airplane hangar, it's going to complain that your area is too small and it'll force you to configure your space to standing only. 
This is actually really stupid. Now, I'm joking when I say an empty plane hangar, but look at this example. It's not like I have that small of a play space. I moved in 2018 and I finally have a living room that's pretty VR friendly. I've tried tracing a play area that went as close as possible to the walls and couch, and still SteamVR is bitching that this space is too small. Really? In contrast, Oculus Home has never refused a single room-scale setup for me. I've always been able to set up Guardian Bounds for myself with that software. How come SteamVR tells me to fuck off unless I map it to an entire freaking continent? The minimum on this thing is way too high. Yes, in my setup, as you see, I split my living room in half with the couch, and I will one day temporarily move that couch over for cases where I want to do some more extreme room scale activities. But no, it's not right that SteamVR won't let me have guardian bounds in a space that's more than enough to provide some. While SteamVR may think smaller spaces are unsafe for room scale, they don't seem to realize how moronic it is to force the user to use standing only, where the only in-game indication of your real space becomes your center circle on the floor. Because then you're left with absolutely no guardian bounds to be able to play safely. It's probably the only big complaint I have left with SteamVR and I really do hope they lower their insanely high minimum room scale limits because they're currently absurd. Now, let's pretend we do get a successful room scale setup. That's the last step of the process. At this point, you're good to go. But now, let's look at what you have to do if this did not work out. For the standing only setup, SteamVR will have you confirm headset tracking, then confirm your center position by holding the headset there, and finally confirm your floor height by placing the headset either on an object of known height, in which case you would enter the height of said known object. For instance, here my chair is 25 inches off the ground, so I'll enter that. Or on the ground, in which case you'd leave the height number at zero, and that's about it. You'll get a play space delimited by a large circle on the floor, but you won't see any guardian boundaries if you walk too far away from your mark. Now, needless to say, for the most part, I play using a standing-only configuration, and this is where we have an interesting silver lining. The last time I accidentally hit anything in my play space was in mid-2016. Since then, I've built up a playstyle that relies on smooth rotation and free movement in-game to prevent from drifting from my initial position too much. Over time, I've also worked on far better tracker alignments, allowing me a full range of motion, along with tracking in the most difficult place, the floor. I have yet to run into any major issues using a standing-only configuration despite the lack of guardian boundaries. Surprisingly, the methods I've applied to avoid moving too far off from my center have not only proven safe over time, but they've also helped raise immersion by a factor of like five. It's simple, if you can play several hours without being interrupted by your real physical world and without the need to peek out of your headset, the immersion skyrockets. It's all about being able to forget you're using the hardware and lately that's what's been happening with me. Long, uninterrupted sessions where I can completely escape. That's exactly what VR is all about. Lastly, for Steam VR, there's a few options I'll want to cover. Now, these runtimes have a shit ton of features, so I won't go over absolutely everything, only the options that have a big impact on gameplay. First off, there's the refresh rate. Now, you won't get this option with every VR headset that SteamVR supports, but for the Valve Index, you'll get the option to toggle between 80 Hz, 90 Hz, 120 Hz, and finally 144 Hz. Personally, I've played around with 120 Hz when not recording any content. In this mode, you'll notice a big difference overall if your system can keep up with the demand. Inevitably, your runtimes are going to rely on motion smoothing and asynchronous reprojection a whole lot when you're in this mode, or at 144 Hz, unless you have a beast of a GPU like a 2080 Ti, there are few systems that can consistently render games at 120 stereoscopic frames per second at the resolution the Valve Index requires. 
Unless you're playing simplistic games like Beat Saber and Serious Sam VR, the rate is going to dip well below 120, and you may end up noticing artifacts from the motion smoothing and asynchronous reprojection. Because I record most my gameplay for use on my YouTube channel, so far I've stuck to 90 hertz. I don't really notice much of a difference most of the time, and I really don't like having to rely on motion smoothing to fill in the blanks, as it doesn't always fill in those blanks correctly. It's a cool feature to have, and it does make the headset future-proof as the runtimes and graphics adapters evolve, but it's not a feature I've personally used a lot yet. Next feature, and I just brought it up a couple of times, is motion smoothing. Think of this as Valve's equivalent of Oculus's Asynchronous Space Warp, or ASW. This one is a mixed bag, and for the most part, I've actually had better results with it off. For the most part, it doesn't actually seem to be having an effect, nothing I can notice. The only time I did notice it was while playing Fallout 4 VR, where I sort of noticed occasional tear lines in my image when moving my head quickly. It seems that when this feature is doing too much work, attempting to fill in the blanks, it can end up producing frames with an erratic image that really doesn't line up well with what you're supposed to see, and so you begin to get visual artifacts. Since noticing this issue with a couple of games, I've decided to turn it off and I haven't since experienced anything strange, but more notably it hasn't affected whatever amount of judder I get inside the headset. It seems that a synchronous reprojection alone is sufficient in aiding with eventual irregular frame rates. Steam VR also lets you adjust your render resolution. You can ask it to run all your VR apps at a resolution lower or higher than the headset expects. Higher resolutions will result in a much crisper image at the cost of lower frame rates, while lower resolutions will give you a frame rate boost at the cost of image detail. You can even go in the video tab and set a resolution scale for specific games. So you could, for example, run Beat Saber at 120% resolution while running Hellblade at 100%. It's an excellent feature. Using higher resolutions is one of the best ways to fight off aliasing in VR. That being said, I myself have been sticking to the default 100%, as I haven't really had the need to increase resolution in most games. The Valve Index's pixel density actually has gone a long way into making the overall image sharper, and that leaves me satisfied the way things are on default. There's just one more Steam VR feature I need to cover, and that's the Display VR window. This has been, in my opinion, Steam VR's best feature since day one. If you're a content creator and want to record your gameplay, the Display VR window is your savior. If the game you're playing doesn't correctly mirror the VR image on your desktop, you can go ahead and record your gameplay from this view. In my case, I like to record all my VR gameplay through SteamVR's Display VR window because I get my VR footage in its full stereoscopic glory. I can set this display window to show both left eye and right eye perspectives at the same time. That's actually the very image that gets sent over to your headset before getting distorted for the lens projection. With this view, I'm first able to make a 3D version of each of my videos, and second, I can finally also make a wide field of view 2D image by stitching both perspectives together with minimal artifacts. This feature is simply indispensable to me, and out of all of the runtimes I've used so far, this has to be the very best implementation of a method to view the image that's going into your headset. Now I do need to give the controller bindings an honorable mention here, because that's the feature that's allowed me to play games that don't natively support the index controllers. Most of the time, if you're looking to play an older game that hasn't received updates for the index, you'll easily find a community-made controller binding that should work very well, put aside some very minor issues. Like I said, SteamVR has a ton of other options, and I invite you to check them out for yourself. Over the years, it's become the strongest runtimes on the VR market, and it not only powers the Valve Index, but supports over a dozen other kits very well, and it's the software behind most of the VR content people enjoy on the PC today, even when it comes to Oculus kits. 
Now we're about to get into tons of gameplay. I wanted to cover absolutely every single possible variant of virtual reality with this kit because my expectations for it were high. I told myself if all this worked out, the Index would become my primary means of doing VR for the foreseeable future, so I wanted to be very thorough about it. One of the first things I did with this kit, something I've done first for most new headsets I've tried in the past, is eye racing. Eye racing is one of the few apps I've run in each generation of headsets since 2013. The Oculus DK1, DK2, and Rift, the HTC Vive, the Pro, and the Vive Cosmos, and even the Pimax 8K, I've come to know what to expect, and since this is a racing simulation, image detail and field of view become very important, so iRacing gives the headset a great test to see how natural the image projection is. Next, I wanted to put the Index through a room scale trial, so I played the forest for a few hours. This is where I got familiar with how the grip sensors on the Index controllers work like virtual grip buttons. The game didn't just get barebone native Index support, they also incorporated finger tracking, giving me a first good look at that. It also helped me get familiar with the button placement and just the overall long duration feel of this kit. Of course, the forest having its graphical moments, either a really nice view or high contrast horror situations, I'd get a good idea of the Index's capabilities with visuals. Next up, I went for a game I'm much more familiar with, having previously played it with other room scale kits, Fallout 4 VR. In this case, this is a game that didn't natively support the Index controllers, so I got to test out SteamVR's controller bindings feature. In addition to that, I would get to see how the Index compares to the other kits I've played this game with. Fallout 4 VR is relatively fresh in my mind, so it's become easy to tell what's improved or not between the different VR systems. After Fallout 4, I wanted to see more room scale. But more specifically, I wanted a pure shooter. By then I noticed how so very solid the index tracking is with the 2.0 base stations, so I wanted to see how it would fare in a game where I need to aim and shoot a lot. I picked Borderlands 2 VR for this extended test. Once more, at the time of recording my gameplay, Borderlands 2 VR did not yet support the index controllers natively, so I'd get to use the Steam VR controller bindings again. Of course, with any new VR kit, there's one game that's an absolute must. We're talking about the first game I played in VR regularly starting in 2014 with the DK1 and the DK2, a game that then received a community-made patch to run on the newer Oculus Rift and HTC Vive, a patch that to this day still works with every new VR headset that's come along, including the Vive Pro, the Vive Cosmos, and even the Pimax 8K. I'm talking about Alien Isolation, but more specifically the map known as The Basement in the game's survivor mode. This level has become engraved in my mind as I've played through it likely a hundred times throughout a series of graphical, performance, and hardware tests over time. It's become the ultimate visual litmus test for any new VR kit I acquire, and obviously I had to put the index through this one. Sure, this is seated VR, no motion controls, you use the mouse and keyboard to play just as you would the pancake version, but it still goes a long way at making a thorough test of the headset's visual capabilities. Finally, I'll give my take on how Half-Life Alex plays with the Valve Index. This takes us into interesting territory when it comes to a new headset review, as I had almost no expectations for this game. Aside from knowing it was going to be in the Half-Life universe, I avoided the hype as much as possible and went in with a totally clean slate. I don't think I've done this in any previous headset reviews. When it comes to tests that define what I think about a new kit, I usually stick to playing something I know, but this time I knew so little that I didn't even have an idea of what I was going to look for in the first place. All in all, we've got six things to cover in the gameplay section of this review, so brace yourselves, that's a couple more different experiences than I've featured in my previous headset reviews. The test with iRacing is simple. Get in the car and drive. 
Actually, in this case, I did a little more and hopped into a couple of official SimCube Delara F3 races. I didn't just want to evaluate field of view and image detail, but I wanted a sustained all-around test. Having very little experience with the Delara F3 car and having only a few laps of track time at Road America with another car, racing in that series would go a long way into showing me what this headset can do. Later on, the F3 series went on to race at Watkins Glen, which happens to be the track I have most experience driving at in the sim, so I joined a race there as well. I quickly noticed how the image detail has reached a point where getting more than this would be a luxury, but it would definitely not be necessary. Sure, the Cosmos had a visibly greater pixel density, but it also had a much lower field of view. The Index has this perfect balance between pixel density and field of view, and it's immediately evident in something like a racing simulation. We're getting so close to reality, all you'd need is the feeling of getting crushed in your seat, tossed around by the corners and curbs, and lifted out of your seat by bumps, descents, and hops. The biggest thing I took from iRacing is how the Index's lenses reproject your field of view to near perfection, almost all the way to its very edges. This is a huge contrast with the Pimax 8K. If you recall in my review of that headset, I complained about how most of the outer field of view is not projected correctly by its terrible lenses. In this case, we're talking about the complete opposite. See, I didn't fully notice what a great job the lenses were doing until I rewatched my video afterwards. There's a moment in one of my races where I clearly remembered looking to my right to notice that, in horror, I was stuck in a three-wide situation about to enter a very fast corner. Now, the way I remembered this happening, I turned my head to the right to look and notice that I was three wide, but in my video, my head didn't turn at all. I realize now that I didn't move my head at all to look. I simply turned my eyes all the way to the right edges of the lenses while keeping my head facing forward. I don't think I've ever subconsciously done this with any headset in the past, at least not this aggressively. Yes, the Oculus Rift had an excellent field of view projection, but it was never enough to make something like this feel so natural. On the long run, having participated in many more races, including a touring car racing league, I can safely say that the Valve Index has given me the very best driving simulation experience I have had with VR to date. The tracking is solid, the center never drifts, the field of view is not just enormous but projected perfectly almost to the very edges. Racing with this kit feels so natural, it's highly addicting, and I'll be honest, one of the many reasons why this video has been delayed so much is the number of times I opted to go practice or race in this simulator instead of taking the time to write my review script. I've always loved iRacing in VR a whole lot, but this has taken it to yet another level. Not only is the image detail and field of view projection near perfect, but the index itself is insanely comfortable, and I have honestly yet to find a limit in terms of how long I can run this thing without taking the headset off. If you're interested in sim racing in VR, I do recommend you get your hands on a good force feedback wheel and pedal kit, such as the Logitech G29, which is what I use. You don't have to get too fancy. By all means, you can attach the wheel to your desk within view of your VR trackers and just go racing. But in my case, I spend so many hours in this thing I've gotten a little bit more fancy, adding a Thrustmaster shifter to the setup, along with a Playseat Evolution to hold everything together, allowing for an even more realistic experience. Notice I did a small modification on my Playseat to allow for more freedom when adjusting the wheel's height and distance. Now that I got acquainted with the headset itself, learning enough about it to realize I very much like it, it was time to tie all the components together and jump into something with full room scale mechanics. I launched The Forest, a game that has optional VR support that can surprisingly measure up to some of the best made for VR titles. Having tried this game with both previous generation headsets, the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive, I'd get to put the Valve Index through a thorough comparison as an overall VR kit. As a bonus, the forest happens to feature a lot of high contrast scenes, especially at night or in the caves. I'd get my first look at how these lenses handle extreme lighting situations. 
I was already surprised right off the bat. See, earlier in my tests, I did try out the Aperture Hands demo, which gave me a great look at the Index Controller's impressive finger tracking, so I already knew about those capabilities, just I didn't expect the Forest to have gone as far as implementing that feature. It was very cool to try this outside of the context of a simple demo and get to experience it for a couple of hours straight. On quite a few occasions, I attempted a very well internationally renowned gesture as I was happy to discover I was using the first VR kit capable of actually reproducing it properly. Yeah, I've tried this before in VR chat and alt space VR using the old leap motion and the reliability of that tracking was far too terrible to pull this off. But with this hardware finger tracking, it's so much more reliable that you can actually make some pretty detailed gestures. It's basically like nothing I've ever experienced before. It's close to Oculus Touch's three state sensors, albeit superior, as this system tracks each individual finger and detects more than just the up-down state of each, detecting even the fine gradual movements. When it came to the room scale experience, it felt like business as usual. Now I don't mean this in a bad way, quite the contrary. The Forest is a game I'm used to being able to play for multiple hours at a time without experiencing any major issues, and this time around was no different. Almost everything worked great, and I was able to enjoy a broad range of mechanics, from crafting to gathering, from combat to getting my ass killed, from hunting to eating. Put aside a single recurring issue that I now believe is a problem with the forest rather than a flaw with the controllers, the playthrough was enjoyable with no immersion-breaking showstoppers. The issue I did experience a few times was strange. The index controllers don't have grip buttons. Instead, the handle has a large sensor to detect the position of your middle, ring, and baby fingers. And when this sensor detects a certain amount of pressure, the runtimes will activate what I've come to call a virtual grip trigger. Each time this virtual grip trigger is actuated, the controller will emit a short haptic bump to let you know you've performed the grip action. Releasing that pressure will emit another haptic bump. For the most part, these virtual grips worked perfectly. I would have been very skeptical had someone described this feature to me, but it turns out it's pretty legit. However, for some strange reason, the game kept putting away my primary weapon at random intervals. Sometimes it would happen repeatedly over a short period and other times it wouldn't happen at all for like 20 minutes. After seeing this problem come back a few times, even messing up my ability to defend myself during an ambush, I began suspecting the virtual grip triggers were behind this. So I paid more attention and sure enough, when the bug occurs, my controller does not emit that haptic bump you get when you actuate the virtual trigger. I'm fairly certain at this point that the problem with the primary weapon irregularly being put away has to do with a bug in the forest rather than an issue with the index controllers. I've run into other similar strange issues in the past with the forest, issues that have since been fixed, so I'm hoping this one gets added on their to-do list because it tarnished what was otherwise an excellent, enjoyable playthrough of the forest. I had a few strange moments while I was playing thanks to this open audio system. There was a snowplow cleaning up our parking lot out back, and on several occasions I thought the scraping noise was coming from the game, wondering what the hell was coming my way. It's only after a few minutes that I realized my game audio was seamlessly blending with my real-world audio. Okay, maybe this isn't ideal, but it was very interesting to experience. It's as if my reality had become the game, and the outside world was sneaking into it. This audio system is one of the best I've seen in any VR kit to date. The Oculus Quest uses a similar open audio system, but the sound is nowhere near as good as this. And audio like this doesn't even come close to compare with the Vive Cosmos, which has possibly the worst stock audio on the VR market. One of the things I was going to look for during this playthrough, the fact that the lenses can scatter light and produce visual artifacts when presented with specific high contrast scenarios, surprisingly did not materialize as much as I would have expected to. This was actually a huge relief to me. See, when I first plugged the headset in, my first sight through those lenses was a view of the SteamVR wireframe room with a dark aurora background selected. 
It's probably a bad idea to evaluate the index's lenses through that view because it happens to be precisely the kind of high contrast scenario you need in order to maximize the light scatter and the glow at the edges of the lenses. I became immediately worried that this issue would manifest itself often, as I had never quite seen lenses scatter light like this, but after my session in the forest, I knew this only happens in very specific situations. Situations that are rare enough that the problem never becomes totally prominent. Aside from two moments throughout a couple of hours of gameplay, the issue was mostly absent to the point where it was either not happening at all, or I was simply not noticing it. It's only in the caves and late during the in-game night while staring at a campfire that I distinctly noticed the lenses producing the unwanted light scatter and it wasn't constant, so in the end the forest reassured me that these lenses won't mess up dark, high contrast scenes too much and that my initial worries had more to do with the fact that by coincidence, the Steam VR wireframe background I was using is a very specific worst case scenario for the lenses rather than the light scatter issue being a consistent problem. Bottom line, the forest was a great first time room scale experience for the Valve Index even this early in, I knew I was likely to enjoy this VR kit on the long term. It took me longer than most people to warm up to room scale VR, but over time I've come to finally have a few favorites that I know I can trust will deliver extremely long sessions of gameplay without annoying issues like drifting out of your physical area or moving into tracker blind spots. Fallout 4 VR is one of these games, and I've come to trust it to give me hours of uninterrupted gameplay. Gameplay during which I almost never remove the headset, not even to peek out of it. In addition to that, it's the only room scale game I've tried with an impressive variety of kits. The Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, the Pimax 8K, and the Vive Cosmos. It would only make sense that I give the Index a good long run in Fallout 4 VR. Furthermore, I'd get a shot at discovering how well the Steam VR controller bindings work with games that don't natively support the Index controllers. This was an interesting setup. Not only does this game require a Steam VR controller binding for the Index, but the best solution at the moment involves using the same DLL replacement trick I used to play this game with the Vive Cosmos, except this time you also need to pick a specific controller binding profile. I'll leave instructions for this in the description below if you're interested in using the same configuration I did. Sure enough, Fallout 4 VR did not disappoint. I played it for over two hours, engaging in every type of gameplay it has to offer, and I didn't experience a single issue. Again, I bring up business as usual, but in a good way. Despite the lack of native index support, it seems the game is future-proof to a good degree, and I was able to enjoy the same experience as before, only with a much higher resolution and field of view, and a control scheme that, while slightly different, posed no issues to the gameplay whatsoever. As time went on, I was beginning to notice several excellent qualities of this headset. The tracking is excellent. The 2.0 lighthouses are a great step up from what we were getting with the first edition. And when it comes to precision, it now rivals what I think was the best tracking of the first generation, the Oculus Touch. Second, I noticed that this headset is insanely comfortable. At the end of the session, I really didn't feel like I needed to stop. I didn't even feel as much as pressure on my face from the headset being there for hours. I could have gone on for far longer if it were not for the fact I knew it'd have to cut the gameplay down to around an hour for the production of a Let's Play episode. I said it during the hardware section of this video, this stock face foam is insanely comfortable and I simply can't believe how cozy this headset feels overall. It's the best fit I've ever experienced. I've heard a lot of complaints with controller bindings and Fallout 4 VR, but honestly, I personally have nothing bad to say. I guess it might be the type of configuration I'm using, but this modified DLL trick makes the game work with Index just as well as it does with Oculus Touch, which was my favorite kit for this game. In fact, I would say this playthrough is one where I experienced the fewest issues with controls overall, which is a welcome surprise. 
My worries with the light scatter issue were further dissipated here because the problem didn't even materialize once since this game almost never has any extreme contrast scenarios. It's at this point I pretty much realized that while this issue can manifest itself in a distracting way, it's extremely rare and shouldn't become a hindrance on the long term. One thing that I was progressively noticing after now three lengthy tests is the index's pixel density. While it's not as high as the Vive Cosmos, it is actually more dense than the Oculus Quest, and it's a lot higher than what we were getting in the first generation of VR. I mention this comparison here because I was able to stare at nearly identical sceneries during my playthrough with the Cosmos, and I could distinctly tell what level of screen door effect I was getting in each headset. Now, don't get me wrong, it's almost impossible to notice in either kit, but focusing my look directly on solid colored surfaces, I could clearly tell the index wasn't quite at the level of the Cosmos. This was to be expected though, while the Cosmos may have this great pixel density, its field of view isn't too hot, which means it's squishing its screen's output over a smaller surface than the index does. Over time, I came to appreciate the much, much larger field of view that the Index offers, and while its pixel density may be around 5% less than the Cosmos, the perk its natural field of view brings outweighs this lesser pixel density. The Index simply takes a more balanced approach between field of view and pixel density, not to mention this is likely the largest useful field of view I've ever observed. Now sure, Fallout 4 VR isn't filled with over-the-top, wannabe realistic physical interactions, doesn't feel like a game that's been specifically built up for VR, but it's still one of my favorite because for me, what makes a game fun to play in VR has nothing to do with specific interactions or complex mechanics, rather it has to do with how much I can escape. And this game features a vast open world that, while not perfect, can sometimes feel like it's breathing life of its own. Spend enough time in this thing and by moments you'll start feeling convinced that you're in a nuclear post-apocalypse trying to find your way and survive. The Valve Index allowed me to enjoy the game just like I usually do, but with a lot of added perks. The next game I picked for my testing would feature an interesting comparison. For the first time I'd be comparing something I've only experienced on PlayStation VR. Borderlands 2 VR for PC released late last year, and I noticed it was taking a beating in the Steam reviews, so I had to find out what was going on. Being a game I quite enjoyed when I first tested it on the PlayStation console, I needed to see for myself if the developers had managed to screw up something that worked fine the first time I tried it. At the time of doing this test, Borderlands 2 VR didn't have native index controller support, so I'd again have to use controller bindings for this to work properly. Playing this game would tell me something very important about this headset. How does the index fare with extreme motion in gameplay? Borderlands 2 in VR can be played with an intense blistering pace, featuring fast movement, ridiculously high jumps, and a need to use all these assets in most combat situations, sometimes at extreme degrees. It can reach a point that matches something of a cross between acrobatics and parkour, and it's definitely not for the faint of heart. Borderlands 2 VR was an absolute delight. I honestly don't understand why people drop negative reviews over nitpicks with VR, but I personally had a lot of fun playing it and it got to the point where I went beyond my initial two hour and a half test and played it for over four more hours only to finally start a let's play of the game, playing through another two hours to produce the first part of that series. I had a lot of fun trying this out on PlayStation VR despite the limitations of that kit, and I was nothing but overjoyed to see this game come to the more capable VR kits on PC with the same useful options it had on its console counterpart. The only one functionality that they hadn't ported over from console, the ability to have your movement controller oriented rather than head oriented, has now been added into the PC version along with native index controller support, so not only was it beyond satisfactory to me to begin with, but it's only gotten better since. I was left scratching my head as to why this game got so much flack. Look, I know that shortly after launch it had an issue where the image projected through SteamVR was not stereoscopic. 
I can understand this being a huge problem. A VR game without depth perception isn't a VR game at all, but the issue was quickly fixed and I'd want to assume most people who left a negative review over that problem would have updated their opinion to something positive, but in the end I guess that didn't happen? It goes to show how important it is not to launch a game with such a major issue, as no matter what you do down the line to fix it, the initial wave of negative reviews would leave permanent damage. One of the things I knew I was going to have to look for, tracking accuracy, kept me very impressed for my whole session. Sure enough, as I expected from the previous games I'd just played, the Index Base Station tracked the controllers so very well, I felt free to make some impressively precise shots, and despite the game having a good amount of bullet scatter to imitate recoil, it did feel like I was in full control of my aim, and that shots that would miss completely were directly my fault, rather than being an issue with tracking precision. This is a far cry from my tests with Arizona Sunshine with the early Vive Cosmos runtimes. We're talking a near 100% accuracy for the index, put aside the rare impossible scenarios like uh, occluded trackers or dead controller batteries. For me, Borderlands 2 VR was a variant of what I seek for my room scale VR games. Extreme movement, good gunplay, smooth performance, and compelling visuals. After running the thing for over 8 hours in less than a week, I can safely say that it's one of my favorites, and experiencing it through the Valve Index made it all that much better. A headset I can completely forget I'm wearing, with over-the-top action gameplay and spotless tracking making for a natural weapon aim, I have no complaints, only praise. Now we get to a game from my earliest days of VR, one that initially released with experimental Oculus development kit support in 2014 and finally got support for the more current headsets with the Mother VR patch, a solution that was developed in 2017 by a user of the name Nibre VR. Despite its lack of room scale gameplay, being limited to seated gameplay using the gamepad or the keyboard and mouse, Alien Isolation has over time not only become one of my favorite games, but it's also become a litmus test to evaluate all sorts of things, from system performance all the way to testing out a new VR headset. Having seen this game through the lenses of the Oculus DK1 and DK2, the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, the Vive Pro, the Vive Cosmos, and even the Pimax 8K, I've come to know exactly what to expect from it, and when it comes to the basement survivor mode map, it's become engraved in my mind so much so that I can immediately tell if the VR headset I'm using is doing things better or worse. Now there was a recurrent issue while I produced the gameplay footage for this test. For some reason, when using the Valve Index with SteamVR's Display VR feature, which I rely on for video capture, the Display VR window would drop a lot of frames. This is strange since I didn't notice any of these frame drops in the actual headset. It seems the Display VR window itself was struggling somehow to duplicate the otherwise smooth frame rate I was getting in the game. I apologize for whenever you notice this in the gameplay footage I'm using here, and I can assure you I've done a few tests to figure out what was going on, and I've greatly improved the situation since. The first thing I was going to do with the index was go back to the lens's light scatter issue. If there's any game that features extreme high contrast scenarios on a regular basis, it's this one, and sure enough it did prove to be the greatest challenge for the index's optics in all my tests so far. While I had a few moments where I would get severe, unwanted glow around the edges of my view, I was in fact reassured by one thing. This didn't happen as regularly as I would have expected. In fact, most of the times this issue came up was in the basement map. Later on, I went to try out another survivor mode map and I didn't actually see the problem occur once. I can give you an example here of the type of extreme situation that the index's lenses won't handle well at all. Look at this view. It's mostly dark, but I've got this insanely bright light directly in the center. I'm remaining still because there's a 9 foot tall alien looking to kill me for sport, so I'm kind of forced to endure this problem for a sustained amount of time and it's distracting as all hell. 
The good thing here is you can probably notice how very extreme this scenario is and thus how rare it is. Its frequency is not only tied to the amount of contrast in the scene, but it actually won't manifest itself if the dark levels in your view aren't at almost pitch black. I really hope to see VR optics improve in the future to address these issues, but in the end, what continues to reassure me is how infrequently I notice this through hours of gameplay in multiple different games. As for Alien Isolation itself, it was as fun as it usually is. I managed to clock my best times and scores in the basement, and discovered yet another survivor mode map, and as usual, I was able to completely forget the VR headset, mostly focusing on trying to survive all the way to my objective. The tense nature of this game's atmosphere, paired with one of the best cat and mouse gameplay, makes for an unnerving experience. And to this day, every session leaves me feeling like I've been mildly electrocuted once I put the thing down. Make no mistake, Alien Isolation at this point could be considered legacy VR, but it's by no means something you should ignore, as despite its simplistic VR support, it's still most definitely one of the best VR horror games, and the second generation headsets like the Valve Index stepping up the resolution and pixel density takes things to yet another level. Another testament to the fact that good VR doesn't lie in complex mechanics, but rather compelling environments and gameplay. You may not have your VR hands in there, but you'll still be persuaded that the 9 foot tall alien really wants to kill you, resulting in ridiculous moments where you'll find yourself cowering in a corner for longer than you really should. While I thought Isolation had more image detail in the Vive Cosmos thanks to that headset's insane pixel density, the amazing field of view of the Valve Index made a big difference here. Isolation is a game you need to play with two things in mind, listening to the sound and preserving situational awareness. Having an enormous field of view that's projected almost perfectly into your eyes goes a long way into assuring a natural feel, helping you notice things all the way to the edges of your view, reacting to these events accordingly. It's a downright tactical advantage in this game, and it's a perk that manifested itself over and over again, often without me even noticing the things I was reacting to were so far at the edges of my view. Originally, I wanted to produce this Valve Index review in February. It was going to be similar to my previous headset first impressions videos, and I really did at this point have all the tests I wanted to perform done and recorded. Unfortunately, I got hit with quite a massive project at work, and I had to put off producing this video for a little over a month. By the time I was ready to jump back into production, I had delayed it for so long that I was now faced with the release of a game I simply couldn't ignore or put off. The makers of this very VR kit, Valve, released their first Half-Life title in over a decade, a game made from the ground up specifically for VR, and likely one of the most important entries of this VR generation. Half-Life Alex dropped, and I had no choice but to further postpone producing this review in favor of giving my first impressions of what was the most anticipated VR title to date. In addition to producing a first impressions video, I had no choice but to incorporate the results of that session into this video. Valve made the game, and Valve made this kit. It's only logical to evaluate the overall experience when both these elements are put together. Look, I'm not much for full-out room-scale experiences. I've always been bothered when a game gets borderline obnoxious, forcing you to interact with janky game physics, and I approach Half-Life Alex with an optimistic yet skeptical tone. I knew the visuals would be way out there, that the gameplay had the potential of being excellent, but I was also very worried that the game would focus a lot on fidgety gimmicks just to rub the fact that we're using motion controls in our faces. Man, I, I don't know how to really say this, but it's not just that I was dead wrong, it's almost as if the game slapped me back to my senses repeatedly over a few hours of gameplay. Damn, I cannot believe how much I am enjoying Half-Life Alex. 
this coming from Valve, I did expect a level of quality and expertise, but holy shit, I did not expect them to have put so much heart and skill into this. I'm absolutely shocked at how smooth and pleasant this game is. The more I play, the more I lean towards saying this is one of the best, if not the best, VR game to date. It exceeded a lot of my expectations by having production value far higher than I expected. Quality voice acting, interesting dialogue, it's sometimes funny. I'm still gonna quote that Vortigaunt for a while. I have a brain injury. My brain is injured. Ouch. Great enemy and level design compelling motion capture, mesmerizing puzzle mechanics that don't get in the way of the action-worthy pace, a nice, well-appreciated focus on horror, these are all elements that I just did not expect to see in this game. The thing that really brought me in awe over all this is how even the things I did expect would be good were done much better than I thought. The visuals aren't just good, they're absolutely amazing, and the designers manage to produce environments with lifelike scales and a level of detail you'll rarely see in first-party VR games. Top this all off with the fact that while the game does feature some of the best physical interactions I've seen in anything VR has to offer, those mechanics are most definitely not rubbed in your face. By all means, if you like to keep things simple, you can. The physical interaction mechanics are presented so casually that they'll draw interest to themselves without ever feeling forced. I personally hate when a game imposes a whole bunch of these on me, and with Half-Life Alex, the difference is I was able to go at my pace, and eventually I started trying a few things because they looked possible and I wanted to try them, not because the game was twisting my arm till I did it. In fact, I'm going to say that despite the fact I really dislike Melee in VR, I was surprised that they simply just didn't include it. Don't get me wrong, I'm kinda happy they didn't. I don't think I'll ever find Melee in VR compelling or enjoyable, but they do have a physics model that looks entirely capable of handling it, so I just found it odd that they opted to leave it out. This playthrough didn't just cement my positive view of Half-Life Alex in place, but it went as far as finally helping me confirm that the Valve Index Kit is my favorite to date. In addition to all the stuff that was obvious to me so far, the near-perfect field of view, the great second-gen pixel density and resolution, the amazing new base station tracking, the super comfortable headset, now I was realizing that the Index controllers are my favorite to date. Having been skeptical about things like the lack of a grip button, or being skeptical about the finger tracking features themselves, I was now realizing how my concerns never materialized. Playing a game with these is natural, and the way they strap around the palm of your hands is just beyond comfortable. It's a bit like the headset itself, it's easy to forget you're using controllers at times because everything becomes so natural. I did struggle with a few mechanics in the game at the beginning, but they're not mechanics I can't get the hang of. The gun reload, the ammo pickup, it was just about getting used to them, and soon enough I found myself doing these swiftly and naturally. Bottom line, Half-Life Alex with the Valve Index didn't necessarily break ground by showing me anything new. The way it broke ground is by instead borrowing elements from some of the best VR titles to date and incorporating them in the very best way possible. For example, a lot of the weapon and pickup mechanics seem to be variants of those in Arizona Sunshine, just done even better and more reliable. The physical interactions were about as frequent as other games in this category, just they were done with a much higher level of quality. Top it off with amazing visuals and production value, and you've got yourself an absolute gem that works and plays like a charm with the Valve Index. With all that gameplay under my belt, and more, I can safely say the Valve Index is the best VR kit I've owned to date. Comfortable, great visuals, excellent controllers, precise large-scale tracking and Steam VR runtimes that are getting increasingly reliable, the Index has become business as usual for me. I was holding on to my Oculus Rift just in case anything went wrong early in my adoption of the Index, 
but I've now parted with my original rift and gave it a second life by handing it over to my 12 year old nephew so he can discover VR for himself. I'm confident I won't be needing any other VR kit at this point given how much I like the index and I honestly only have one concern left, one that is gradually fading away with time. See, when this kit began shipping, the manufacturing process Valve were using gave for quite a few defects and reliability issues, issues that I was very afraid I'd run into. From defective thumbsticks on the controllers to base stations dying for no reason, I've read my share of horror stories from the early launch days of the Index and they kept me on guard for a while. So far though, I'm 6 months into owning the kit and I've yet to run into a major problem or failure of any kind. It seems that most manufacturing issues were resolved before I made my purchase and so I've got one of the more mature versions of the kit. You can literally throw an Oculus Touch controller at a wall with full force and it will survive the impact and it's obvious that the index controllers are nowhere near as sturdy. So I know I'll have to be extra careful with these, but again, I've owned the kit for long enough and so I found ways to take proper precautions without actually affecting my immersion. It's come to the point where I never have to peek out of my headset to know where I am in my physical space. Using the edges of the protective floor mat I use for my chair, I'm able to tell exactly where I am in my space without looking, and so I can safely play even without Guardian Bounds active. The last of my worries, and I think this one will always linger, lies with the reliability of the base stations. The first generation of Vive Lighthouses gave me my share of issues. Not only did one of my own go defective only months after getting that kit, but I had to go through Vive's RMA process to get it repaired. In addition to that adventure, we have three full Vive kits at my workplace and sure enough, three of the combined six base stations eventually had a critical problem and needed to be fully replaced. Having seen a few instances of similar problems with the 2.0 base stations, I can only cross my fingers and hope that they're rare enough that I'll never need to replace mine or have them repaired. So far I've taken one important precaution to extend their lifespan as much as possible. I never leave the base stations plugged in if I'm not using them. See, these things work with moving parts. There's a motor inside that spins a little mirror around in order to scatter the infrared rays. And it seems pretty obvious to me that the more you give this motor a break, the least likely it is you'll get any failures on the long run. I'm keeping my hopes up, and so far not only have I not had a failure, but the stations are still working a lot better than the first generation variant and aren't showing any signs of wanting to stop soon. Yes, I still think both the Oculus Quest and the Vive Cosmos are excellent second generation kits, but in the end, the Valve Index simply beats them both. Obviously, if you're looking to get into virtual reality or thinking of upgrading your first generation system, this is the first kit I'd recommend, provided you're ready to cover the larger price tag. If you're too skeptical to take the gamble, yet still want to get into virtual reality somehow, there is absolutely nothing wrong with opting for the slightly less expensive Vive Cosmos or an even more affordable Oculus Quest. In general, the second generation kits from all three manufacturers step up their game and bring the upgrades you'd expect along with a few new tricks. However, the index stands out by a good margin beating the Quest in terms of pixel density, the Cosmos in terms of tracking reliability, and both competitors in terms of field of view. Top this off with these novel controllers and you've got yourself a near perfect virtual reality system. Sure, I could toss in my concerns with reliability to counter how good I think the index is, but so far it's not given me any reason to go there. It's been smooth sailing ahead. Now before concluding I do need to make a note, as you may have noticed in my past headset reviews I did mention, game by game, what I thought of the stereoscopic 3D, or more simply put, the illusion of depth perception. 
This time I decided to just make a mention of this at the end of the video, because in every single thing I tried, the depth perception I got was absolutely natural and believable. No need to repeat myself over and over. As I've said when trying the second generation headsets with greater pixel density than ever, the higher resolutions have raised the bar even higher on this already amazing property VR has to offer. The Valve Index was no exception to this. People tend to take the 3D depth for granted, but honestly, it may be the single most important aspect in VR. Virtual reality without depth perception simply is not real virtual reality. When it comes to depth, the index delivers, possibly better than its competitors thanks to the way the lenses unwarp the field of view so accurately. Sadly, one of the defining moments throughout all my testing wasn't actually properly recorded, but I do have to bring it up again even though I already did earlier in this video. I spent over 8 fucking hours straight in Elite Dangerous without even noticing the time was flying by. Not only is 8 hours ungodly long, but it beats my previous 5 hour and a half streak playing Ark Survival Evolved with the original Oculus Rift by 3 hours. When I completed that session, I honestly for a moment believed I had accidentally changed the time on my system because I refused to believe how much time had gone by. That alone is a testament to how this headset is pleasant to wear and can be easily forgotten to the point of completely, completely losing track of time. Remember, in my opinion, VR is not about having all sorts of experimental mechanics and physics thrown at you. Primarily, it's not even about what the controllers can do. It's about running a game or a nap that can produce a compelling environment, a natural illusion of depth perception, and the impression that you're visually trapped in what you're playing. The onus doesn't only fall on the software's end, but it's on the VR kit to have a good balance between resolution and field of view. Precise tracking with lack of software and hardware issues. A comfortable fitting headset that can be worn for hours on end. And this is exactly what the Valve Index delivers, and I'm looking forward to spending years with this kit. Folks, it's been a long time coming, but now you finally know what I think of the Valve Index in great detail. If you've had some experience with the Index yourself, I'd love to know what you think of the kit in the comments below. Doesn't even have to be positive. If you disagree with me on any elements, by all means, share away. I'm just as interested in hearing about the negative opinions as I am the positive. I understand that put aside general consensus, not all of us will have the same experience and it's fun to be able to debate our various perspectives. Okay, I really hope you've enjoyed this lengthy presentation. God, my voice is fucking dying. If you've made it this far in the video, thank you very much. You've been watching Stereo 3D Productions and this review of the Valve Index, and I shall see you next time. Holy shit, I actually finished this thing.